Hi everyone. Hi. My name is Paul Bowen. Um, call sign Papa Echo One November Uniform Tango. Like many good people, I'm a radio amateur, and I have a slightly bigger dish to play with than most other ones. It's not not just mine, and I'll get into details about that. This is the Dwingelo Radio Telescope. It was built in 1954, opened in 56 by our Queen Juliana, and at that time, at 25 meters diameter, it was the largest radio telescope in the world for about a year and a half. Um, I'm not going to go into all the numbers because we've lost three minutes. Um, I'm a member of Comras, which is a foundation named after C.A. Muller. Uh, Lex Muller, a former head engineer and professor, uh, worked on the telescope and was also occasionally using it for ham radio activities and doing very well, of course. Uh, we are not, we found 2007 taking over from the dish after a distinguished scientific career. We started using it basically for amateur radio and for uh, uh, radio uh, amateur astronomy or amateur radio astronomy, as you say. We have at least 300 sponsors. Work on the teaching programs on outreach, on observing with it, uh, on doing ham radio with it. So this is just a picture of, uh, it's already a little bit dated, of some of our at the reopening of the dish in 2014 after it had undergone a complete restoration where even the dish was lifted off decades protective coating and painting and looks much better now, almost like brand new. Apologies to anyone watching this on the stream. Um, C.A. Miller ra Radio Astronomy Station, we have three goals. Making the Dwingler Radio to the communities of amateur radio astronomers and radio amateurs. So yes, that means you can actually, under certain circumstances, come and use it. Uh, stimulating the interest in science and technology, in particular for the youth, by providing access to the telescope, and preserving and maintaining it as an industrial and scientific monument. But let's get into the technical details. This is our dish, low noise amp actually right here in the focus. We mix it down with the signal generator because the receiver that we have uh, only, go only goes so high, it doesn't actually go high enough for what we want to do. And then we go into a back end, which is the part that digitizes the signal and makes it ready for uh, processing. And then it comes out to Ethernet and we store it on a server with lots of hard disk, uh, rate configuration, etc. All of that at the moment is locked to a Rubidium clock so we have good timing and frequency. We can capture at once about 25 megahertz of spectrum. And this is what it looks like in the early reality. Um, I've drawn some colored arrows. These are the antenna connectors. From there we go to the mixer, then we go to the receiver, and then we go into the back end. And the back end is basically a software-defined radio. And then here are the LO signals, and over there you have the rubidium, and that is our astronomy PC. I already had the edge PCB uh, on my doorstep. Um, these are for scale SMA connectors. Pin pitch is here, a half uh, millimeter. You need something to drive it. Uh, I didn't feel like hand soldering an FPGA, so I opted to use a Xilinx development kit. This is the FPGA itself. It's a three, Spartan 3A because it's, um, it's a Spartan 3A DSP. We use this chip. This chip is the gigabit Ethernet driver and the Ethernet connector, and the rest of the thing we don't really use. <coughs> if you build it all together on my kitchen table, a uh, signal generator for, uh, for the mixing, this is actually simulating the hydrogen line. This is the receiver, and here it goes into the AD converter through a little bit of rainbow flat cable into the FPJ and then the Ethernet, and you actually see the spectrum. Oh, great. I thought I had killed all software on this thing. Yeah, apologies for that. Go away. Uh, it took about two years to get it into a proper box. It took a lot of uh, complaining from the other volunteers. because You can't just have it laying around on a piece of cardboard. Um, so again, a converter, FPGA kit, JTAC for programming it, power supply, a little display so you can see what it's doing. 
And that's when it's in operation and you have a little spinner here that shows that it's actually getting the clock signals it needs. Uh, we have a lookup table with the FFT window function, so every incoming sample gets multiplied against the window function. FFT, FFT block, which I didn't make myself. The output of that are real and imaginary, uh, which gets squared and added, so then you actually have the power per frequency. For every frequency bin, I keep integrating the received power. Uh, the reason for that is that otherwise the input here is already 700 megabit. The output there would be a lot much, a lot higher and that would actually exceed the throughput of the Ethernet connector. So we do 64 integrations here and then we dump the spectrum. So I developed three personalities for the backend. Uh, pulsar mode, where it takes 512 samples, applies the window, this is the FFT. That gives you a spectral resolution of 137 kilohertz and 2,000 uh, and something spectra spit out per second. Looking at the hydrogen line and other spectral lines, you want more resolution. So we use the biggest FFT I could fit into the FVGA, which gives a 17 kilohertz resolution and then 267 spectra per second, a bit, bit more sedate. And then if you really want the fire hose approach to uh, radio astronomy, you simply try and get all of the samples out over gigabit. That came a few years later when I had learned enough FPGA to actually be able to pipeline the CRC calculations, etc. And that gives you a gigabit of data, uh, which you then have to uh, offline process. A little bit of radio astronomy. A pulsar is the remnant of a core, sorry, the, the remnant of the core of a star that collapsed after it went through all of its fuel. A very violent collapse called a supernova. It's still heavier than the sun, but the gravity is so much that it completely gets squished together. The atoms can no longer exist. You only have neutrons left. And as it gets smaller, it actually spins up due to conservation of angular momentum. And you get a sort of a lighthouse beam at two ends that rotates around. And if the Earth happens to be in line with one of the lighthouse beams, we will see a very small increase in the amount of noise that we detect. And this is a recording that I did, and you can see, beep, beep, you can see how regular they are. They're bright enough for us that we can see single pulses. You can also see they're slanted, because due to the interstellar medium between the pulsar and us, the lower frequency actually gets delayed more. And that's actually 1 over f squared, so it goes, it goes really like so. So the lower you get, the more delay you get. But out of these, you can measure lots of interesting facts about pulsars. And I can actually show you, you can see the slanted uh, there and there. You can actually see the slanted arrival of the pulsar signal in time. And of course, if you don't have quite that long an antenna, what you take is you observe for longer and then knowing the pulsar ratio, you can actually fold them together. But having, um, having a 25 meter dish is sort of having cheat mode for detecting pulsars, of course. And in the telescope, we can actually listen to them live, which is a great demo for, for, for outreach when we have people visiting. A hydrogen, I'm not going much into theory, but in the universe, in, in space, it exists in two states, and a Dutch physicist discovered that it would actually radiate a 21 centimeter. Uh, that's the famous 21 centimeter light, and that frequency is extremely accurate and, and stable, and that means if it's not on that frequency, that is because it's moving towards you or away from you due to the Doppler shift. This is a scan of our galactic plane, and if you download the slides later, this will look a little bit better. Uh, projector is not quite doing it justice. But what you he see here is basically the rest frequency of hydrogen. Anything that's higher is coming towards us. Anything that's lower is going away from us. And this actually, these structures you see here, these arcs, actually correspond to the spiral arms of our own galaxy. And that is the thing that the discovery of the hydrogen signal allowed us to to show that our own galaxy is actually a spiral galaxy. We can also, just to uh, an RGM, we can also uh, see GPS L2 signals and we see them significantly above the noise. This is without using a preamplifier because we don't have a preamplifier for that frequency. This is actually the civilian signal and this is the wider spread military signal. This is the other band where you only have the military signal. 
we can actually, from this signal, de detect the individual ones and zeros, so to say, the individual BPSK values before the spreading. And then write your own software and decode it, etc. But in the interest of time. By then, we're uh, getting like three years ago, and I had started to, le to learn about GNU Radio and actually got my own SDR and wanted to play with it. And wanted to introduce it also to the Dwingelo telescope. And for the existing backend that I showed you, I made a new GNU Radio compatible mode. I already found out that if I put in 70 mega samples per second, RPC didn't keep up. So I made a mode where using a um, two-stage fur filter, we take the center five megahertz of our pass bond, convert that into I and Q interleaved uh, samples, spit it out over Ethernet, so that it gives us about 160 megabit, which the PC can keep up with. And you can just straight plug that into the radio, into the UDP receiver block. And that also shows stuff that the F One of the things we would like is more sensitivity. If you do the naive FFT window, FFT window, then at the edges of the window, you're basically multiplying your samples with values that are near to zero, so you're not actually using the samples. So you want a much larger window uh, and not throw away your data. And there's a method in the radio astronomy called weight overlap add. To do that, where you have your input samples, you multiply them with a much longer sample than your FFT size. The <coughs> mathematical trick is that pieces and then add them piecewise together and then do the FFT. So instead of doing a large FFT and then folding it together, you do the folding together first and then the FFT. And if you look at the difference in shape, how nicely, how much more rectangular uh, the PFB is compared to the regular FFT, you simply get nicer, much nicer shape in your frequency domain and that actually relates to the fact that you're using more of your samples. Now, the radio has a polyphase filter bank block use. Unfortunately, that outputs the PFB bins as single outputs instead of as a vector. So if you want to do 4,000 of them, you need, uh, you need to draw a hell of a lot of lines. So instead, I implemented WOLA sorry, uh, in the radio. And this is actually from um, the Aspira lab. And the, the link is at the bottom. And these are all, all the values that you need to fill in to make this work. But if you are going to do radio astronomy with an article as the air, for instance, this is a great way to get just a little bit more sensitivity when looking at the hydrogen line. Um, so this is the UDP where, where the samples come in. The, I convert them to complex, in, so interleaved shorts to complex, and then it's just a normal flow chart where you've got the four different change, uh, each with a, little, with a different delay, and then they're all added together. We do the FFT with no additional windowing, of course, and then complex to magnitude, and then we start to integrate. And then we get in trouble, because in radio astronomy, we, d we, we think in, in integration times of seconds, for instance. If you integrate up to, say, a second, then by the time the vector sync actually wants to show it to you, that's like two and a half minutes or so, because it takes a long time to fill this buffer. So what we're actually do doing is we integrate it, and whenever it is full, we actually repeat the output 40 times just to flush, just to flush it so that our display is a little bit real time. Um, so that's a useful trick, low, low band with uh, new radio stuff. And what you can actually do with this is, for instance, um, we looked at M74, which is a spiral galaxy that we see at, at, uh, sorry, face on, which means that all the rotational Doppler is basically uh, normal to our line of sight, so it's zero, so we don't see it. So all the 21 centimeter ra radiation is just almost on the same frequency, which allows us to actually detect it at a distance of 30 and a bit million light years away. And that took, uh, to get this signal to, to noise, even with our telescope, took, uh, I think, an hour and a half of uh, looking at the source, looking next to it, looking at the source, et cetera, and repeating that every 100 seconds. Another thing we do with the same uh, backend and then the new radio interface that we made, we now have a flow graph to do SETI. And SETI, uh, you might all know the, the SETI at home screensaver. We're working together with the SETI Institute and we are now going to do SETI at Camras, where we record with our own telescope at the locations of interesting new, uh, newly discovered pl planets. And then you'll be able to actually process the data on your own PC. And because it takes lots of bandwidth, 
we do what happens often in radio astronomy is we use very few bits in our sampling. And actually, the SETI at home data is one bit sampled, zero or one, at two and a half mega samples. So the back end gives us five megahertz. So I throw away half of it, decimate by two. Uh, complex to float, I interleave them, binary slice them. So I have only one bit, pack the bits into bytes, and that goes into a file. And basically, we, are, we have now written all the software uh, where we can actually feed this to the SETI at home and we can actually run this flow graph is actually run on our own data. And what you see here is ON0 EME. This is actually a beacon in Belgium that is aimed at the moon and then we aim our dish at the moon and then we can easily see it. And we are hoping to start off to kick off our, uh, the public site of Rossetti uh, at home this year. Uh, it's a Chinese satellite. It is in orbit around the moon. And before it got launched, they asked us if we could be a ground station, help them out, uh, because we have quite a few square meters of antenna for this. Um, what we often do is we track this satellite as it is around the moon. Um, we at the moon, because our, our beam is not much bigger than the moon, so we actually need to know how far the satellite is from the moon. And one of our volunteers wrote code that actually calculates the offset so we point a little bit next to the moon so they have the best signal. And then we actually stream this uh, on our website and everyone can just listen into it. You can uh, try and decode the package yourself. You can actually also do it with a, a reasonably big antenna. The software for decoding DSLWP is actually public. It's made by the Chinese and it's on GitHub. So you see it's just a GNU radio out of tree module that you could use. Um, and if you want to look at the images that we download and the telemetry, that, uh, that lots of people are downloading from the satellite and all uploading to this website. Uh, once again, these slides will be online, I think, on Monday because I uh, left the, uh, the, the password to the, to the Pentabarf account at home. And this is a picture that we downloaded on uh, last Wednesday. So this is the student CMOS camera, which is the amateur radio payload. And it sends packets out, which we decode, and occasionally packets are wrong. And then somebody in Germany... repeat that block and then that block is repeated and we receive it and they from all the packets from all the receivers around the world they on their website they built this nice little image and this is actually in the Chinese mythology the moon is a little bunny and the Chinese students were very happy to have seen this bunny from very close by and you might have actually seen a very famous uh, image that, that they took where the earth and then the uh, where you see the moon and then you see the earth behind it. That was really big in the news a few, uh, few months ago. So finally, radio astronomy and resolution. So the resolution that you have in a, in a telescope is depending on two things, your wavelength and the diameter of your, of your mirror. So the Hubble Space Telescope is 2.4 meter diameter, but works at a wavelength of 600 nanometers. So this point zero. 06 arc second resolution. Um, so full circle is 360 degrees, then 1 60th uh, of a degree is an arc minute, 1 60th of that is an arc second. Compare that to a 25 meter telescope, which is 10 times as big, but you're working at a wavelength of say 6 centimeters, you suddenly you have a resolution that is 10,000 time, 10, times worse, which makes radio astronomy much less interesting in a sense. So if you want to have comparable resolution to what the uh, optical world is doing, you actually would need a dish with a size of 240 kilometers. And then we get to what to do as a day job, which is I work for the uh, for JIVE, the Joint Institute for VLBI uh, in Dwingelo, the Netherlands. And we actually coordinate the European VLBI network. We um, process the data that all these telescopes that you see over here generate and this whole array of telescopes together can work as one virtual telescope that has like a diameter almost the size of the earth and therefore you get uh, unsurpassed resolution I think it's still the highest resolution that you can get in in astronomy um, you can see uh, many famous telescopes like Effelsberg 100 meter Archibo 300 meter diameter uh, the Americans have their own VLBI network. They have lots of telescopes as well, of course. There are many more, but these are the core telescopes of the uh, 
European VLBI network. And one of them is missing, I think, and that's the Dwingelo telescope. So, and this is where my hobby and my work start to complete in, completely intersect and become indistinguishable. Uh, a few months ago, I wrote a VLBI front end or a VLBI flow graph for the Dwingelo telescope. So we take the samples. Um, this is 310 now. We have an actual USRP now. We, we don't only have our uh, uh, homemade FPGA thingy. So with the TwinRx, uh, we sample the data. We, 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 show, we, we uh, bring it down to a standard bandwidth that, you, that we use in radio astronomy. Using a polyphase channelizer, we bring it down to four channels. These are complex, so over here I, I simply take, turn them into upper sidebands. And then over here we sample them into two bits. Because again, due to storage limitations, we don't want to use too many bits, so we use two-bit sampling. Um, ran into a bug in GNU Radio, where if you try to do a low number of bits, then it gets a little bit confused about how it actually wants to do the rounding. Most of the time it uses one way of rounding. Occasionally it uses different, but that is being addressed. At the moment I just use the full rate of a float and then I look, use a lookup table to bring it down to two bits. Then I put on the VLBI headers that tell you what the telescope is and very importantly what the time is. And then it goes to file because I can't do this in real time. But still it works and on August which is a professional radio telescope, Joller Bank in the UK, the Mark II telescope, and the Dwingelo telescope. And what you see here is the cross-correlation product on each of these baselines, and you can see you get a nice signal-to-noise out of it. That in itself is just an intermediate product. What we actually end up doing is taking the Fourier transform of how it's of all of that in all the different constellations as the Earth rotates, and out of that you can work back to the image. That itself would be a two-hour talk, not going to do that. Uh, things I still have to do, at the moment we're using a rubidium. We have a white rabbit link. Uh, it goes all the way from the maser over here to, well, almost here. We're like 300 meters short. We've already dug the fiber. Um, we've uh, put the fiber in. Uh, this Wednesday we're going to do uh, the fiber welding and then have it complete. And the other thing, which is a big challenge because I need to have this done by early March, is it doesn't work in real time, so I'm currently uh, taking this flow graph and turning it into a RF knock flow graph, which is a bit of a challenge. So, if you're interested in cameras, what we do, keep in touch. Uh, I'll put the slides online, including this one. We have a website, we have a mail address, GitLab for all the stuff that we make, which is open, including the VLB, sorry, including the VHDL design of the backend. But I would not encourage anyone to look at it because I'm not good at VHDL, uh, and also it's a 10-year-old design. Uh, we have a Twitter and we have a Instagram. We also public. We also have public observation data. If you want to look at pulsar data, process it yourself. If you want to look at diesel, diesel WP data, for instance, and especially if you're from around Holland, we welcome new members. And if you're interested, uh, get in touch. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, this is just a process in, in the back end. This is just an FFT picture in the back end. Well, also, it, it, it has to do with statistics, as in, over a long time, this should be uh, n the nice uh, sink shape that you would expect. But this, this, this is just done over 512 samples and then, and then averaged over like 40 seconds or so. Uh, the other thing is there are actual imperfections and nonlinearities, and you see that, for instance, here in, uh, in the place where it actually should be zero, and you get these little... Uh, and that actually has to do with the fact that if you square the signal, you collapse it. Okay. So how do you synchronize the, the In VLBI. Um, so in VLBI, we actually need to have the phase at each telescope the same, or at least uh, a known offset. And what currently happens is that every of those participating telescope has its own hydrogen maser because that's really the only frequency standard that has sufficient stability. 
One of the things I'm working on at the moment is upgrading White Rabbit, improving White Rabbit so that it actually, uh, and not just me, but together with colleagues and collaborators, that it can actually be transported over fiber. Um, and we're, we're, we currently have a 160, uh, nine, I think 170 kilometer link White Rabbit running. And we'll, we'll, in the next few months, I'll be showing that it is sufficient to do VLBI by actually doing VLBI between the Dwinglow and the Westerberg radio telescopes. Time and, time and phase. Okay. Um, but you have like one thing in the UK and the other in Holland? Yeah, well, the one in the UK is still on its own laser. Okay, but then how do you get the phase? To uh, actually, in VLBI, what we do is we don't really care about the absolute phase. So at the beginning of an observation, because they're hydrogen maser, they're very stable, but they're not very accurate. So you measure the frequency of each of the different hydrogen masers, and then you keep using that for your observation. Um, yeah? 